Hello, hello, and good afternoon. How are you doing, Nicola? Hi, 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 Heini. Good to see you and uh, glad to be here uh, with you today. I'm doing good, and you? Yes, I'm doing really well as well. And well, I'm really excited that we got this topic of, of discussing how to use Apache Spark in Microsoft Fabric. Same because... here, and I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because for me, it's one of the parts of Fabric that I really like to use the most. Yeah, I, I have to be honest, I'm still learning it. Uh, yeah, but uh, as more as I learn about Spark in Fabric, uh, uh, the more I love it. So, yeah, I'm also very excited to, to be in this session today. Yeah. Exactly. I think it is one of those things where you need to get going a little bit. Uh, the start can feel a little tricky, but then once you get going, it can get a whole lot easier and we can kind of find out how powerful it is. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Great. So today we are here to present along this Learn Live module that there is this link for on this slide and the QR code that you can snip from there. And this is the second session of this Learn Together series that we're at. And I'm myself, Heini Ilmarinen, and I live in Finland and work for a Finnish company called Polar Squad. Uh, I work with DevOps topics, but I look at the DevOps topics from the data platform perspective, from my point of view. And yeah, I'm also a data platform MVP. And today here I have Nicola with me, who is a fellow MVP with me. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, uh, I'm Nicola. I'm originally from Belgrade. But for the last uh, almost eight years, I live in beautiful city of Salzburg in Austria, mm -hmm. uh, where I work uh, with Microsoft Fabric and Power BI uh, predominantly. And uh, yeah, the reason uh, uh, so the 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 because I live in in Salzburg and everything here is in sign of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I took this <laughs> nickname Data Mozart because of that. So yeah, it's, I'm trying to make music from the data. Oh, that, that sounds amazing. Amazing. And hopefully with this session also people are able to, you know, make everything harmonious within Fabric as well. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. Great. So today we are also joined by uh, two amazing moderators behind the scenes. Uh, they will be interacting with you in the comments section if you have any questions and relaying also those comments to us. Uh, so today we have Kay Sauter, uh, who is a senior BI developer and also a fellow Microsoft MVP. And you also have his contacts there as well. And as the second moderator, we have Sunaj Kumar, who uh, is also a Microsoft MVP and a data manager at Data Singapore and also his contact there for LinkedIn. So I, I would say we're in good hands also because uh, it's quite difficult to follow all the questions while being uh, live here. So it's really helpful to have the moderators behind the scenes helping us out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as I can see, there are more than 300 people currently watching the live stream. So uh, uh, I'm deeply grateful to our moderators for joining us today and <laughs> helping with the handling questions. Yeah. Great. And then uh, here is the links for you so that you can follow along as we go along this session. So we will follow along the learn module that you can find through this, this link. So it is the use of a spark in Microsoft Fabric module that we're at today. And we will kind of go along the same flow as there is in the learn module. But of course, we have a little bit of a chance to give some additional information while we are doing it. So hopefully you get a little more from this than just reading the learn modules itself. Yes, exactly. And what uh, Heini said, uh, after you watch this, you can go and practice on your own. It would be probably much easier. Exactly. And of course, we want that this session will become very interactive. So please do write in the chat, say hello, tell where you're from, uh, what's your experience with Fabric, and ask questions because that is the benefit of watching this session live. Then you are able to get those questions maybe answered even here online, so with everybody. So please do engage so we can make this as interactive as possible. And for learning fabric, there is a really 
a good resource here shared with you. So there is the Fabric Career Hub that is available. And there is a lot of uh, good content there that you can use for your fabric learning. And for example, you can see here that there is a 50% discount on exams, for example. And that is, of course, always very, very useful. And then you can also find videos and career ad advice and things like that from the Career Hub as well. So many interesting resources that you might want to take a look at. Yeah, what I just wanted to add. So you are not alone on this journey. So uh, learning fabric can be uh, can, can look like an intimidating task. So you are not alone. And uh, this Fabric Career Hub is a great place to... Uh, to, to start your learning path, but also to network with other peers who are mm -hmm. also looking to learn Fabric and uh, take DP600 exam. Yes, exactly. And of course, there is uh, very specific details about even uh, like what kind of role could you have as an analytics engineer or data analyst or so forth within the context of Fabric. And you can even find some like sample architect diagrams as well as what kind of skills you should have, maybe even what could be the expected average salary. I'm not sure which region this applies to, <laughs> but anyways, you will have all that information available there as well. So you can kind of start your certificate journey also from the Career Hub. You can join a Cloud Skills Challenge and you find all the Learn Together series information there as well. Then you can register for an exam and then there should be quite soon coming a practice exam as well. And then you can schedule an exam as well. So, sounds easy and straightforward. Exactly, very simple. <laughs> the one part is of course to still you know, accumulate the uh, knowledge that is needed. And we're here now on step two in the Learn Together series. So after this, yeah. you will be ready to go for the exam cram to prepare for the Step exam two, itself. session two for today. <laughs> exactly. Very true. Uh, yeah. Very, very true. And yeah, here is also the information about how to uh, apply for the 50% exam discount. So make sure to use that since it is... Yeah, it's, it is actually quite a substantial uh, discount that you get from that. So then you have like 30 days to complete the challenge. And that means that you go through all the modules kind of related to that specific exam. So if you join this session today and then afterward you go through the module and you join the other sessions as well and do the same thing, then you would have completed uh, this this challenge as well. So make sure to sign up for that. I have one pro tip, if you don't mind. So there is yes. <laughs> ongoing on, ongoing Cloud Skills Challenge, which ends in two days, I think on 19th of April, which gives you 100% discount. So if you are fast <laughs> enough, uh, but, uh, please don't go now, go after this session. And uh, then you can join the Cloud Skills Challenge, quickly complete those eight modules and you get 100% discount. Yes. You have to be really, really fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very well. So, uh, yeah. So here's also the link to the exam cram. So there is actually now, after this uh, series of Learn Together, there is an exam cram coming. Uh, it will be on May 8th from 4 to 6 Central European time. Uh, so make sure to put that in your calendar and you kind of have a prep day for the exam itself, where you will be able to also see some things about the exam format and how to just be ready to take the exam as well. And with that, we start to get towards today's content. So where we are at this series is we are at the second session. Uh, Yesterday, there was the session about how to get started with end-to-end -end analytics. And now we're going to like zoom in more in detail with Apache Spark. And then in the following sessions, kind of going into the different parts of Fabric and zooming in there to all of those different portions so, so that you can be really have a lot of knowledge on those areas as well. So we will start this journey one piece at a time so, so it's easier to keep up as well. Are you ready, Nicola? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to 
uh, to to go through this session and uh, yeah, show all the things you can do with the Pashi Spark in Fabric. Great. All right. So in regards to what will be will be will we be covering today is we are going to look at how to configure Spark. Uh, what do you need to do to be able to just either run notebooks or jobs with Spark in a Microsoft Fabric workspace? Then we'll look at how to identify suitable scenarios for Spark notebooks and Spark jobs. So there's kind of these two flavors of using Spark within Fabric. And then we'll look at how to use data frames to analyze and transform data. And that is the very like traditional way of working with data in your Spark notebook. Then we'll also look at how to use Spark SQL uh, to query your data. And this is, of course, if you're maybe more familiar with uh, SQL language, this could be a little more approachable than using some of the other languages. But of course, uh, the benefit of Spark is having this huge variety in what kind of languages you can also use. And then, of course, lastly, we might want to visualize data. So we'll today look at specifically how can you look at visualizations within a Spark notebook. Sounds great to me. Yeah. So let's start with a little bit of introduction and maybe looking at what is Spark, because I think that is a very important question to look at first. And Spark is an open source parallel processing framework. And you might have heard this parallel processing framework even in other contexts. And what it normally means is that we are able to split a specific task to multiple compute nodes. Uh, so that we are able to run that specific task in parallel. And since we are talking about data, that means then we are able to process our data in parallel. So behind the scenes in the Spark architecture, there is actually a control node. So the one that orchestrates how is that job split, which cl cluster nodes does it run on, and so forth. But luckily, uh, when using in Fabric, we don't have to worry about that. And then there is the actual nodes that run the queries and things like that on their own. And due to this architectural uh, approach that there is for Apache Park, it means that we are able to really run large scale data processing and analytics. And sometimes with Spark, it can almost be like, it seems like the performance is the same, whether you are running it for a hundred row data set or a thousand row data set, it doesn't matter. It's It kind of scales as our data amount scale as well. So that is kind of something that can be maybe a little unexpected if you haven't worked with uh, Apache Spark before that. There is, as I already mentioned a little on the side previously, there is many languages that we can use for, for doing our coding in. So we can use Java, Scala, or PySpark, or even SQL, if we wish to. What is your favorite, favorite flavor, Nicola? My favorite flavor is definitely uh, Spark SQL, because I'm, I'm coming from the SQL background. So whatever can be done in SQL, I'm doing in SQL. <laughs> thanks for asking. And yours? <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's PySpark, I would say. Uh, it's just so powerful within the Apache Spark framework. So there is so many cool things that you can do. And we'll, of course, show some of those today. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, kind of when you use Spark in Fabric, the nice thing is you don't have to like set up the control node and the workers and everything. And you don't like have to set up a lot of networking and compute and things like that to get going. But instead, it is fully managed. And you just need to configure a few things that we will look at in a little bit. And there is even like a default Spark cluster set up for you. So necessarily, you don't have to do anything to get started. And the thing is that, of course, if you would want to, you could, like in your on-prem environment or in your cloud environment, you could run up a Spark there as well because it is open source. So you could run it anywhere that you want, but then you would have quite a bit of management overhead that you would need to take care of. So if we start to look at the context of Fabric, on the Fabric side, of course, 
we don't need to do so much setting up. Uh, it is kind of ready to go for us, uh, for Spark. And each of the workspaces that you create will have a Spark cluster assigned. And it will have some default configuration in place by default. But there is, there is like a possibility that you can also edit that. Uh, we will in a moment see this in practice. And I, I think actually the view has changed a little bit from this slide specifically, uh, but it still has kind of the core things that there is for us to configure when we are setting up the Spark cluster for our workspace. And then it is the workspace admins that then can manage the settings for the Spark cluster in the workspace settings. And for example, you can choose the node family, uh, kind of what size is it, and then you can set how many nodes it can have, what is the runtime version. Uh, so if you want to direct people to use a specific runtime version, you can do that. And then some other Spark properties as well. So that is the gist of it, but we will see a little more as we go into the demo as well. One of the most common things that we need to do uh, when we are running with Apache Spark is that we might need something in our notebook that is not there by default. And in that case, what we might need is we might need some kind of libraries that we import into our notebook. And there is already out there in the Spark open source ecosystem, there are countless uh, code libraries available. Uh, there is almost libraries for anything that you might think that you need to do. For example, if you need to manage uh, coordinate systems, which is like a very specific kind of thing that you might need to do with coordinate data, or you might need to, um, you might have some more basic processing that you might need. But what you can do is that also these libraries can be managed at the workspace level. And there you can then say, which library do you need? What is the version? Where is this sourced from? And so forth. And then you can have those libraries available within your workspace for all of the users that are there. So it makes the management quite a bit easier than just having to import everything and, you know, kind of somehow separately manage this per user, for example, or per notebook. And with that, I think we are ready to go on to the demo to look at how this looks in practice. And I will hand it over to Nicola for this. Thank you, Heini. That was a great introduction. And uh, yeah, it, it's nice when people hear about certain things, but it's easier when they see with their own eyes. And exactly. the, the final <laughs> stage, I would say, when they practice on their own. So uh, I'll do a quick, uh, short introduction, a short tour uh, about Spark configuration, things that Heini already mentioned uh, uh, in previous few minutes. So I'm currently in my Fabric-enabled workspace. And I sincerely hope that you already know how to create a workspace itself. If not, uh, go and watch the, uh, session one from yesterday. Uh, but just in case that someone is here who haven't joined uh, yesterday's session for whatever reason. So you go to a workspaces on the left-hand side, and then you simply create a new workspace. In this case, I already prepared a workspace, which is called Learn Live. It's fresh as a daisy, so nothing is still <laughs> in there. And uh, we will today build some stuff here. But before we build some stuff here, we need to make sure that our configuration is uh, set up properly. So uh, depending on the resolution uh, uh, on your screen, you might have seen this workspace settings uh, tab also listed here next to the manage access. So because I am using a different uh, resolution for my screen, it's under three dots. You will, you will maybe see it all already here. But once I click on workspace settings, there are a bunch of different things uh, that we can set up and configure. In this case, we are interested in Spark configuration, right? So all the way down at the bottom, at least as of today, as you saw on, the, on this slide, things are changing in Fabric rapidly. So as of today, this setting is uh, uh, down at the bottom. Maybe it will be pushed somewhere else. But at this moment, so you go to this data engineering data science uh, tab, expand it, and then under Spark settings, there are different uh, 
option configuration options that uh, you can adjust according to your needs. For this demo today and for preparing for DP600, I would say you are good to go with default settings. But in real life, in production environment, you may want to change certain things. So instead of using this starter pool, which is provided to you uh, by default, maybe you want to create a new one. And then you also can uh, change the number of nodes, change different uh, 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 other options here. The, uh, for example, to customize compute configurations for items, turn this, this on or off. Also environment, this one is, uh, I would say, one of uh, more interesting things in Spark configuration. Mm -hmm. Environments can be useful. And Heine, please correct me if I'm wrong with my understanding that if you have uh, different libraries and you want them in different workspaces, so you can create multiple environments within one workspace, for example, and then uh, 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 provide access to some detailed visual libraries, for example, to a certain group of users. Uh, that, that's my understanding about the environments. But yeah, I would say a useful, very useful feature uh, in uh, in Fabric. And also you can change the runtime run version. This one that I'm currently using is the latest one. I'm not using experimental. You can play on your own if you want. So that's where you set, where you set default environment and where you, where you set uh, runtime version. Then also under uh, high concurrency, I suggest you keep this option uh, turned on uh, because then multiple notebook, notebooks can use the same Spark application uh, to reduce the start time, uh, so the time needed for Spark cluster to get up and running, and also automatic log, uh, which is helpful for uh, automating uh, machine learning experiments and models in the background. As I said, in real life, maybe you would want to change some of these settings, but for the purpose of uh, our demos today and for your uh, own preparation for DP600, you are good to go with uh, with default settings, I would say. What do you think, exactly. Penny, something needs to be changed at this moment or not? Yeah, I think we are good with this. And maybe just to comment, like previously in the slide, there was like a libraries link right below the Spark settings. Here, so this yeah. has actually moved now that it is contained in the environment side. Uh, so when you go into the environment and you create your environment, then you can also specify which libraries you want to install as well. So uh, as we can see, things move around at quite a fast pace. So it's good to have like a little bit of an experimental mind that if you don't find something also later on, it could it, it that the UI changes a little more going forward. So if something has moved, just click around a bit and try to figure out where where has the specific setting gone? This is yes. will probably keep happening for quite a while still. Yeah. And if you watch this uh, uh, session after a few <laughs> months and you, you can't figure it out, don't blame us, blame Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, like in the fabric documentation, there is always the most recent uh, instructions. So if you just then search for Spark library management, you will be able to find that. So this is where you would then, when you create an environment, then you specify also which libraries you want installed there as well. Yeah. And yeah, that was this short introduction just for uh, Spark configuration before you start doing the, the uh, let's say, real things. Yes. Uh, handing back over to you. Thank you. So of course, once we get our compute set up the way that we really wish to, then we want to run some Spark code, of course. So we will go back to the slides for a moment to just look at the basics and then come back to a demo again as well. So when we're talking about running Spark code, uh, and we have kind of two different options that we can choose from. We have either Spark notebooks that we can use or, well, notebooks. It's not Spark Notebook, sorry for my language. Uh, and with that, we are able to then use whichever of the languages we would like to use within Spark. Or then the other option that we have is to define a Spark job definition. And then you define that job and then you can schedule it in whatever way that you would like. 
The nice thing uh, about the notebooks is that we have this interactive environment that we can use for code and also adding collaborative notes. So we have the option of adding uh, comments into the section, uh, just into our code cell. But we also actually have an option of adding like a markdown segment there that will then render as text. So the idea of notebooks is so that you are able to put in both your logic in terms of code, as well as your comments and descriptions that tell what does this code do. And if you really do use that efficiently, then it will make easier for others to understand your code as well. Also, it can be <laughs> for at least for me previously, when I was getting into Spark uh, for the very first time some years ago, uh, it was confusing to me, like, how does this then run, you know, when you schedule it and things like that. But again, it's just the UI that makes, you know, the cells uh, visible for us. There is specific, like, file, uh, file formatting on the file so that then it can also run uh, on a compute cluster programmatically. You don't need the interactive uh, visibility that we have in this slide. So we are kind of able to go cell by cell here, uh, create both comments, and then of course, put in some uh, logic as well. The Spark job definitions is different. It is a non-interactive -inter script. So in a notebook, you can go cell by cell and see the output that it produces. In the Spark jobs, you create a script and then you hand it over it. So you can here see the kind of the things that come up when you create a Spark job definition. So you give a file, which at this type, you, time you can give a Python file, and then you can either upload it from locally or a Azure storage account. And then you could also have a reference file uh, if there is kind of references from your main file. And then if you have any command line arguments that that script requires, then you can also put them in, in that text box that we have on the screen. And if it is also using some kind of specific lake house, we can also specify it here as well. So you can think in terms of that the Spark jobs are more like a script that you provide, and then a notebook is where you have these cells of code and text that you, uh, where you write your whole whole thing. And of course, the bigger dif biggest difference is that with notebooks you can work interactively, whereas with the Spark job definitions, it's a non-interactive script. Then if we start to get a little closer uh, to kind of the data itself. So uh, if we look at, look at kind of reading some kind of file that you have, uh, one common format is of course CSV. And if you have a file where you have a row with headers, you can have Spark will try its best to infer the schema that is in use there. And well, with some file formats, it is better than with others. In some file formats, you even have the metadata of the schema coming with it. And we'll talk about Parquet a bit more later. But even for CSV, it is able to infer the schema to some extent. It's, it's not always perfect. And you might need to then uh, do some adjustments yourself on that schema if it's not exactly true. And of course, we have many file formats that we can read uh, into a data frame. Uh, so there is quite many options that you can use as a source data. The other option is that we, when we read our data into a Spark data frame, we can set a schema explicitly. So tell what is actually the context of our data. So we have the same data set. Uh, and we can say that we have this product schema and there we have uh, these different fields. We have the product ID, which is an integer, a product name that is a string type category, again, a string, and then a list price 
that is a float type. So we can specifically say what is the format of each of those columns as well. And that way then when we read that CSV file, uh, we have this spark read load command that we use here. We set the path of the file, where are we reading it from? Then we give the format. Then we specify the schema that references that schema that is just created there beforehand. And in this case, we don't have the header. So we have these multiple options that we can specify in our read load command here. And one of them, of course, is the format. So if you have some other format, then you would have to specify that differently. Uh, and then, of course, for example, the header information can be important, especially with CSV format. Then, of course, once we've read our data into a data frame, we might want to uh, transform it in some way, I would say in most cases, we don't just want to like copy our data from one place and then put it in the same exact format to the next. So we might, there's a few very common things that we might need to do. Uh, with select, what we are able to do is we are able to create a new data frame where we select specific columns from our or original data frame. So we then just provide a list of the column names in the select statement. And that is how we're able to just get a new data frame with maybe some less data in it. Another very common thing that we might need to do is uh, filter rows. And we might use the where statement to do that. So in this example, we are creating the bikes data frame. And we're using the original data frame to select first three different columns. And then we are filtering just where uh, the da data frame category column equals mountain bi bikes. And it's it's good to notice that in a lot of cases, there is like alternate ways of doing things. So we, for example, for filtering, we have the where statement, but we also have a filter statement. So once you start to uh, use Spark a little more, you might come across similar or functions that have similar capabilities, and then you might need to figure out which one to use. And then the last example here is the group by and aggregation functions, but this one uh, specifically is a group by clause. So here again, we are using the original data frame and creating a counts DF for our different counts for per product category. So we're just choosing two different columns and then doing a group by, by that category column, and then doing a count. So what this would produce is that it would group each category and have the count of each category there. So very similar, if you're coming from the SQL world, you could do a group by and a count, count for, for your column, and then get the total count for each category from that. All right, I know this can be very like, uh, we're just seeing this on the slides and not having any context. So that's why we're gonna go to Nicola to show us the demo and what does this actually look like in practice? <laughs> that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Exactly. That was a great, great uh, overview and great introduction of, uh, of the things that we are going to uh, cover now. So again, we are starting from the, from the completely empty workspace. And uh, first of all, we need to take one step back, or to be honest, not one, two steps back. So in order to work with the Spark, we need some data. And uh, we need to store this data somewhere, right? So we need a lake house to store the data in Microsoft Fabric. So what I'm going to do now, I'll click here on a new tab on the top, and I'll create a new lake house. I'll give this name Learn Live and wait for a few seconds for uh, Fabric to create this lake house and also uh, additional items that goes hand uh, by hand with creating a lake house, SQL Analytics endpoint, and default Power BI semantic model. But you will learn more about those two in the uh, next sessions. So once I'm in my lake house uh, user interface, on the left-hand side, I see the Explorer, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I see the in the Explorer area, I see two main folders, tables and files. 
they will seize managed area of the lake house. So the Spark takes care of managing uh, tables that are part of tables folder, whereas files is not, the, this is the unmanaged area and you can store literally any type of file here. So not just uh, structured data like uh, Parquet or Delta, but also some, some non-structured uh, formats. In this case, we'll keep it simple for this demo and I'll use uh, a CSV, uh, a bunch of CSV files. So uh, to bring those files into Lakehouse because now it's completely empty, I'll click on three dots here next to files, and then I'll choose the option upload. Now in real life, you, you are probably not doing this way. So you will not bring your bring data from outside into a fabric by uploading all these files. That would be really weird, I would say, but uh, there are more convenient and efficient ways to do it, like using a pipeline, for example, uh, and orchestrate your uh, data ingestion process. But as I said, this is just for the demo purposes, so let's keep it simple. I'll click on upload and then upload folder. Then let me find my folder here. Here it is, orders. I'll click on upload. And as you may see, there are three different CSV files that are included in this folder for each year. So 2019, 20, and 21, we have a separate CSV file. Uh, now this was loaded into uh, into Lake House, and now on the left hand side I have this folder orders that once I uh, refresh it, it contains three different CSV files. I can quickly do a, a, a preview of my data and see how it looks like. So for each of them, I can see what's going on. So now we have data in our Lake House. Okay, that was the first step, and now we can start. Uh, leveraging all these things that Heine mentioned in uh, previous few minutes. So while I am in the lake house uh, uh, area, I can directly from here create a new notebook. You can, of course, do it from the workspace uh, user interface as well. But once you do it directly from here, this notebook will be automatically, uh, this lake house will be automatically attached to a notebook. And you can then start immediately writing your uh, PySpark or Spark SQL or whatever language you prefer code in, in this notebook. So I will click on open notebook, this uh, down arrow, and then choose new notebook. There you go. So uh, this is a notebook, a uh, very basic one with just one cell at this moment, but I promise we will have a lot more uh, during the demo. Uh, the cool thing about notebooks is that, and what I love about them is that, uh, it's not that you, you can just write code inside the notebook. You can also uh, uh, use this formatted text or, or uh, how it's called, marked, uh, markdown text. So in case that I want to uh, here, instead of code, to use this as a markdown text, I can simply click on this uh, M icon, M with down arrow, and this will convert, uh, convert it to uh, a markdown text. And of course, if I need to edit this, this text and say, uh, we all love fabric, for example, <laughs> then it will be written here. And from there, I can add new cells, both code and markdown cells, depending on uh, what I need. So let's start with loading some data into a data frame. Uh, data frame is the essentially the, the basic structure that exists uh, within the Spark. And before we proceed, just one more thing, because Henny already mentioned that you can use different languages uh, within the notebook. Default one is PySpark, but if I click here, I can choose between Scala, uh, Spark SQL, and R, Spark R, and we will use Spark SQL also uh, during one of the next demos. But here on the top, you can switch between the language that is uh, used within the Spark notebook. Okay, so let's start loading our data into data frame and uh, I'll start by expanding my orders here and then let's first load this 2019. Let's start from the, from the first file. So if I click on three dots here and then load data, I can select to load data into Spark and this will create, uh, this will create a, a code cell let me just close this so we have more space here. Uh, so this will create a cell uh, with code uh, automatically generated for me. And let's run this code. Uh, let's run this cell. 
So I will click on this one uh, arrow on the left hand side, and this will execute just one single cell. Of course, you can run them all here on the top, but let's start with running this uh, first cell and let's see what do we have here once it's completed. So we are doing live. Hopefully, demo gods are with us. <laughs> yeah, you never know what will happen. Yes, that's true, especially when you run run it for the first time. It first uh, needs some time to start the session. So for this mm -hmm. Spark cluster to get up and running, uh, usually it takes uh, like less than 10 seconds. But yeah, today is <laughs> a little bit slower. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. One okay, minute so four to five you'd... seconds, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, now it's started. Now it shouldn't take yeah, long. Yeah. One neat thing that when you are running the shells, if you're clicked into the shell, you can just press shift enter as well, and that will run the command one specific cell as well. So once you get really That's fast and going, yeah. Yeah. yeah, then yeah. it's very convenient. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind as well. Thank you. So this looks great, right? Or maybe not. Uh I would like to ask people in the chat what's wrong with this uh, with the results from this uh, uh, of this data frame and uh, because we don't have too much time to to uh, to wait for all the answers I assume you realize that our uh, column headers are eh, a little bit strange <laughs> I would say those are the records from our CSV I don't know what do you think honey Yes, I would say so too. It looks like it just took some of our data as the very header row exactly. for us. Exactly. And that's because in our CSV file, we don't have headers. And while we were creating this data frame, uh, we left this op option for specifying header set to true. So in case that I change this now to false and rerun this cell again, now, fingers crossed that, yeah, it looks better. It looks better. But st I, I'm still not happy, but it looks better. So now we have these C0, C1, C2, and yeah, those uh, names for our columns, which are ah, still not so user-friendly. So let's go and uh, fix this as well. Uh, remember when Heine told you about creating explicit schema for your data frames? Uh, and that's exactly what we are going to do now. So I'll create a new code cell and paste the code here. So this time I'm importing a SQL library here and I explicitly defining schema for my data frame. So in this case, I want to call my columns uh, like this, sales order number, sales order line number, order date, customer name, and so on. And then I'm specifying the data type for each of these columns. So once I, uh, and finally, I'm reading this from CSV file, and I want to load this data, uh, to load the data which is stored in my 2019 CSV file within orders file under files uh, section within the lake house. And let's see how does it look now. And it seems that oh, our yeah. audience is awake because they also don't notice that the data typing wasn't so good in the first, yes. first version. Yes. That's true. So now we have everything uh, properly set. Uh, you see the, the data types here. For, the, for example, this is uh, a string type. Then we have sales order line number, integer, date, and so on and so on. So this, this looks good now. I don't know if you agree with me, but this looks, now, this, this looks good now. Yes, definitely. Yeah. But the problem is, I mean, it's not a problem, but we just started. So we have data just for 2019. But remember, we have three CSV files, 2019, 20, and 21. So now I want to load uh, all the data into this data frame, not just 2019. So what I'm going to do, I will just replace this explicit value of 2019 with, uh, with the wildcard symbol, so with star. And once I click on this, I hope to get data also from, yes, it is, it's here. So you see data from 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, uh, wildcard symbol you can use to uh, load uh, basically multiple files, data from multiple files at once. So you don't need to go uh, through each and uh, every single file one by one. You can use this uh, 
uh, uh, this wildcard symbol to get them all at once in your data frame. In this case, this is just a subset of rows, so I can't uh, confirm that there is also data from 2020 and uh, 2019, but it, obviously it's not uh, 2019 uh, only anymore. Mm -hmm. And now I would say that we are ready to make some data exploration. Now that, that we brought the data into Lakehouse and we brought this data uh, from files into our data frame, I think it's a good moment to do some basic data exploration within the data frame by using PySpark. And I promise I'll cover all of these things that you mentioned in, your, in the slides. Uh, so filtering and grouping the data, uh, aggregating, aggregating and, and everything else. So let's start by filtering. And I'll do it like this, like a, a real professional filter data. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so let's filter our data and I'll create a new code cell and I will run this code and then I will explain what do we have here. So for filtering data, you can do it in multiple different ways, obviously. Uh, if we want to vertically filter the data, so to get just some of the columns from our data frame, uh, I can specify those columns here within the data frame definition. In this case, I'm interested only in customer name and email, nothing else. So I can omit all the other uh, columns. And also I can perform some simple uh, aggregated functions. In this case, I want to count the total numbers or number of rows in this data frame. You see there are 32,718, but also I can perform a distinct count. For example, if you're coming from uh, SQL world or Power BI world, you are familiar uh, with differences between count and distinct count uh, functions, uh, I assume. And uh, you see that there are 12,000 and 12.5 thousand, let's say, distinct customers. And here is the list of all these distinct customers. So that's a simple uh, vertical filtering where we keep just some of the columns that we need uh, for our data exploration. What else I can do? I can again click uh, and create a new cell. In this case, I will run it again. I'm enriching this previous uh, uh, previous uh, cell with ver clause. Here it is. And I'm returning all the customers uh, who bought this item, this product road 250 red, whatever. So you see that there are 133 distinct customers and total customers who bought this product. So you can also include their clause similar to what you can do uh, in SQL language. Uh, then the next topic that we are going to show how to do is aggregating and grouping the data in the data frame. So <clears throat> let me create a new one and I'll say now, aggregate data. Okay, I didn't do this properly. Maybe I need to make like this. Yeah. Oh, I'm becoming yes. professional. Yes. So I'll create nice. a new code cell and then uh, paste this code just to quickly explain what we have here. So again, we are creating a data frame and uh, we are creating this data frame by uh, providing a select method, by running select method. And we want to group the data. So let me zoom it a little bit. So we are grouping data by the item. And then we are running some. Sorry. So we are grouping by the item. And then we are running some over numeric column, which is quantity in this case. And what this uh, query will return, all the items that exist in our uh, data frame. And it will just sum, uh, return the sum of the quantity for, for all the, of these items. So looks very simple. My friendly advice to you is if you plan to take DP600, pay attention to these methods, pay attention or the order of, of uh, methods and how they are being run through uh, uh, the, the uh, Fabric Notebook. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is how to uh, essentially change the names of the columns. That's also part of data exploration here. Again, I will use PySpark uh, uh, SQL, uh, Spark SQL, sorry, uh, for this example. And in this case, I'm 
uh, essentially extracting the year uh, from the order date. Remember in the order date column, if I scroll back up, let's find it. So this is the order date column. The idea is to extract the year from here. Okay, so this is exactly what this one will do. It will e extract the year from my order date column and it will uh, give it a uh, alias called year. So that's the name of the column in our data frame. And I want on top of this, I want to group the data by year and count total number of, uh, of uh, records that we have for each year. And finally, I want to sort this by year. So in this case, you see that for each year, how many records we have in our data frame. Similar, if you have SQL background, similar logic. So you start with select, then you do a group by, and then you do an order by. In case you need to include where clause also before group by, you can include where clause. So this reminds a lot of uh, a regular SQL language. Uh, additionally, what you can do with PySpark and Fabric Notebooks is to transform data files. And uh, I would say this is a very common task when you are uh, working with data. Probably the data you get, uh, the raw data you get, it's not of uh, 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 appropriate quality and you need to enrich your data, data set with some uh, additional logic, some additional columns and so on. And that's, as I said, a common task. And you can easily do that with, uh, with Fabric Notebook. So I will uh, show you how to uh, transform and add some uh, additional columns to your data frame. In this case, what I'm doing here is, uh, I need to put, let me put the whole thing and then I will go one by one and explain because uh, you will see results only when I put everything. So again, I'm using Spark SQL library here. And in the first step, uh, line number three, so here, uh, I'm, uh, adding additional column, which will be called year. And essentially, like in the previous example, I'm using a year function to extract the year from the order date column. And I'm doing the same for, for month. So I will create additional column called month, which will use month function to extract month from the order date column. Uh, similar logic for uh, creating the first and last name fields from the full name of the customer. Remember, we had a full name of the customer. In this case, I want to split this column uh, on uh, the empty space between the first name and last name, and then take everything that is on the left-hand side from that blank space, leave it as a first name, and then uh, I will take everything that is on the right side of this blank space and create a column last name. And finally, uh, I can reorder the columns. Let's say that I want to see year and month straight after the order date, which makes sense, uh, then or first and last name before the email of, uh, of the customer. So I can reorder uh, the, the columns within the data frame. And in this case, I'm displaying top five rows from this transformed data frame. As you see, here are our new columns, year, month, first name, and last name. So very, very straightforward and easy once you get your head uh, around it, but it's nothing to be uh, uh, afraid of. Uh, you can use the full power of the Spark SQL li library to transform the data. So by filtering rows, deriving, removing, renaming columns, and applying any other uh, modifications and adjustments that are needed by your uh, business case. And I think that's it for this demo. I'll show you how to save this transformed data uh, in one of the next demos. But before that, I'm handing back over to Heini. Great, thank you. That was quite a bit of <laughs> transformations and reading and everything happening in one go. And maybe at this point, we could just get one of the questions that we have in the chat. So there was one question about when you run different uh, languages in a notebook, then what happens behind the scenes? Uh, are there, for example, separate VMs running Python and a separate one running R? And how do I pass data from one language to another? So you can definitely run different languages in different notebook cells, even within one notebook. So there is this magic syntax that you can use where you use the percentage 
And for example, if you wanted to run SQL in a PySpark notebook, you could do percentage SQL or so forth. So you can always change a single uh, cell that you have in your notebook. And it all runs on the Spark cluster. So there is not like a difference on that. And of course, on the Fabric side, we are not managing VMs at all. But of course, somewhere behind the scenes, there is the compute running, even though we don't see it on the surface. And within Spark, there is kind of the Spark core engine. And then there are the different languages built on top of that. Uh, so that is kind of what is happening behind the scenes when you run those different languages. They are all built on top of the Spark core engine. And then it depends a little bit how you pass the data. But for example, if you do run that cell of SQL code in your notebook, uh, you could do a select uh, on your data, for example, then I believe it's something like underscore SQL DF that you can then reference that as a data frame, that output from the SQL syntax that you are running. Uh, so that way you can then continue processing that data in the next cell, for example, again with PySpark. But there, there is definitely sometimes a little bit that you need to do to be able to transfer seamlessly between the different cells and languages. And with that, I think we can continue on to talk about then how do we save a data frame and go back to the slides. So, of course, once we've done all our filtering and transformations and things that we want to do for our data, we want to then save that data frame somewhere. And today, when we're looking at the Fabric side, we are really working on the files section of the Lakehouse Explorer. Uh, so we really have that data on the one lake uh, layer there. So when you are ready with your data frame, then you can use the write function then to, to write that data wherever you would like. So there are several different modes that you can use. So you can overwrite. Uh, there's also an op option to append if you just want to keep adding data. Uh, but if you're, for example, working with a full data set that then would always get entirely refreshed, then you would want to overwrite that. Then it's different if you get like new a new data set that you need to add to what you have existing. So you need to always consider that. In this case, we are writing a Parquet file. So in that Parquet section, we are specifying where do we want that to go. So we are have the files section of the Lakehouse uh, portion that we're using. And then we are having a subfolder called product data. And then we're saving the data frame as bikes Parquet in this case. And then if we have a whole lot of data, we might need to partition our data in some way. So what this does behind the scenes is that it actually divides your data sets into different folders. So if you have, for example, a data folder, then it will uh, create a subfolder by the partition key that you are using. So in this command that we have here on the slide, we are partitioning by year. And that means that then we have a different folder per year. So for example, we would have year equals 2020, year equals 2021. And then we are able to then, again, if we need to query that data further, we are able to specify which of the partitions, partitioned parts we want to query as well. Again, in this case, we are using the overwrite mode and uh, specifying part K. Uh, and here we are putting it all into the data folder. So we don't then need to specify the partitioning folders themselves. Uh, that is done by the partition by method that we are using. Yeah, so with that, I think we're also ready to see how does this look in practice as well? Yes, happy to show you uh, in this demo. This will be uh, a short one. So we are basically showing uh, how to save uh, uh, transform data. So remember in the previous step here, we already transformed data uh, as we wanted. So we included additional columns. I want to save this transformed uh, version of the data so uh, people can reuse it for their workloads. 
And uh, as we saw in the previous example on the slide, in this case, writing mode will be to overwrite. So basically, if there is uh, a file with the same name, I will uh, uh, this uh, uh, this code will overwrite it. You can also choose to append it uh, if necessary. And we are specifying parquet as a format. Parquet is preferred for data files, I would say, uh, because it's uh, very, very uh, suitable for analytical workloads. It's a columnar format, also contains metadata, and uh, it's very performant, compresses data well. So it's it's de facto standard, I would say, uh, in today's analytics world with when working with files. So in this case, I will save this uh, data frame as parquet file uh, within my files area of the lake house, transform data folder and orders. Uh, and finally, if everything went well, I want to print out this message transform data save. So I will run this. It will take probably a few seconds and transform data saved. Now, if we go back here, don't pay attention to this one because I was testing something previously. So if I go here and uh, refresh my files area, you see transform data and there is my orders folder and uh, Fabric automatically created three different parquet files for uh, for this uh, data frame. I'll close this and show you also how you can partition the data. And essentially, this helps. In this case, we don't have like too many rows, 30,000 or something like that. But if you're dealing with huge amounts of data, partitioning can be a lifesaver. So it's, it's not a bad idea to uh, do file partitioning when you are writing data to, uh, to a lake house. In this case, I'm partitioning data by year and month. Again, overwriting and uh, everything else stays the same. And I skip another one. Sorry about that. So first I'll read this data to a data frame. And once it's re it's in the data frame, I can use it to, uh, so I skipped one, uh, uh, one step. Sorry about that. And uh, now it should run successfully, transform data save. Again, I will refresh the files here. And if I go to orders and let me just find it. No, that's the same. It should show different months. Maybe I skipped something. So let me check in the code quickly. If not, we will not waste too much time. So year, month, all right. File, files, partition, data. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe, Maybe you I'm have to refresh. Seeing, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not seeing partition level. data. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's it, it's go it's good to go one step back and check what you wrote. Uh, so in this case, under partition data, you see that I have different folders for every specific year, and under uh, every specific year, data is partitioned also by month. And if I click here, uh, you see that for 2019, I have uh, one parquet file for each month. So that's how you partition the data. Again, very helpful in scenarios when you are dealing with uh, with large amounts of, of data in, in the files. And uh, that that's all what I had for this demo. Handing back over to you, Henny, and yeah, moving to my favorite part, to be honest. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we are going to now go to Spark SQL, as you might guess from the comment that <laughs> It is Nicola's favorite part. So that is the next portion that we are going to talk about. And so Spark SQL, there was actually a question in the chat about what is the difference between SQL and Spark SQL that I managed to see at one point. So if we remember that Apache Spark is a distributed system, both in that sense that we have all those worker nodes, but on the other hand, we also have the compute separated from the storage. So for example, in Fabric, our storage layer is one lake. And then we have the compute layer, which is separated from that. Whereas if you we look at the relational database side, in that world, those are most, in most cases, coupled. 
And of course, we have many different flavors of SQL as well. Uh, but if we, for example, compare to SQL, uh, Spark SQL is specifically really optimized for these scenarios where we have dispersed data, data sets. So when you ha we have this distributed computing model. So, and the other side is that it's able to handle both structured and semi-structured data as well. So that is kind of some of the differences. But of course, the syntax is quite similar, which is of course nice, nice when we have been maybe using Spark SQL previously. So as one point, uh, how we might work with Spark SQL is that we might use the Metastore to define tables and views. So here we are creating a temp view first. So that means that it is available for our notebook in our Spark session that we have going. So the first, first rows is there where we are creating the products view temporary table. So this will create a view in the Metastore. And then uh, when we are creating a new table in the Metastore, we can use this save us table and use Delta Lake format. So uh, Delta is kind of an abstraction that has been made based on Parquet. So in addition to the Parquet formatted files that we will see in the folder, we get also a separate folder with some metadata related to the Delta format. And that is what enables us to, for example, have asset transactions with this file format, uh, like very <laughs> flat file format that we use here. We're not using a relational data database, but we actually have separate files in a folder that we are using here. So with this second uh, line here, we are creating a table named product. It is also possible to create an external table. So that is where we specify what path or in what path in the file section of the lake house are we saving that data for our table. So again, we have our data frame that we want to save. We use the right method, use the Delta format, and we save the table as so that we give it a name. And then in addition, we give it a path where it is stored in the file section. So with all of these, we will now see something more appear in our Lake House uh, Explorer than just the file section. So we will see that in practice in just a moment, what will appear when we use these commands. But on the other hand, we might also want to use Spark SQL to query. So uh, behind the scenes, since there is the Spark SQL API that we can call from PySpark for example. So uh, to do that, we are actually still running in a cell that uses PySpark. And there we are just able to reference spark.sql. And then within the parentheses, we give our query that we want to run. And there was this question actually about word wrap, wrapping the code in the chat as well. So kind of this example also shows how you can do that. So you can use these, um, what is this called now? Backslash? <laughs> uh, backslash, yes, backslash. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you're right. That sounds correct. So we can use the backslash to move our next rows, kind of split our code onto separate rows. We're also able to use the Spark SQL directly. So use the magic command that we see here to run our SQL query as regularly as we would like. So with that, let's move on to the demo. Yeah, thank you. We are moving on again to our cool notebook. I already have 16 cells. Oh, wow. I'm it's getting I'm bigger. <laughs> yeah. And you see this one is called use SQL. Yay, finally. So uh, in this cell, I'm uh creating a new table which will be called sales orders and i want to save it as delta uh and you already explained what delta means so let's go and create this table and uh the other command that starts in line five will essentially give me a nice description of my newly created table in terms of column names uh data types and so on 
So let's be patient for a few more seconds. It's still running, so yeah. Nice, so this is description of my table, all the columns, all the data types and uh, other stuff that I might find useful. But here, if I refresh my tables folder, finally, I see sales or finally, I see a Delta table here. Uh, you can recognize it based on this small triangle icon in the bottom right corner. So that means this table is stored in Delta format. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. And uh, another thing I want to show you is how you can essentially query the data. But before that, uh, I'll go to sales order, load data, and then I will load it to Spark. So uh, I can essentially uh, then manipulate this data with using Spark SQL. In this case, I'm just returning top 1,000 rows, uh, all the columns and top 1,000 rows from uh, my sales orders table. You see the naming here. So this is uh, 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 essentially, this enables you to combine uh, data from a lake, different lake houses and lake house and warehouse. So uh, in case that I wanted to use this table in conjunction uh, with data coming from a warehouse, then uh, three part name would be uh, uh, required. In this case, I would provide the name of the lake house, the name of the schema, and then name of the uh, of the table. And then I can combine also data from lake houses and warehouses. Uh, also, what we already mentioned, what Henny mentioned, is that this magic command, uh, basically this one uh, uh, enables you, when I write uh, double percentage sign and then the language, the specified language uh, SQL, that indicates that the Spark SQL language runtime should be used to run the code in this specific cell instead of PySpark, which is chosen as, as a default language. And if I run this one, so all of you who are familiar with SQL probably know what to expect. Essentially, we are uh, extracting the year from the order date and just doing a sum over uh, this mathematical operation of multiplying of unit price and quantity and adding uh, tax value on top of it. So now uh, at this stage, you can write SQL, uh, Spark SQL, I would say from my experience is 98% the same as uh, ANSI SQL. So yeah, almost mm -hmm. all the features and all the functions uh, work the same way. And uh, with that, I wouldn't take too much time talking about SQL anymore. I'm get, uh, handing back over <laughs> to you, Henny, for uh, I think last part of our yes. session for today. Yes. So the last bit that we want to talk about is visualizing the data. And we're not going to the Power BI side of Fabric at this point, but we, there is actually ways to visualize data in a notebook. So you might have spotted in some of the notebook outputs that Nicola has been showing already that there is not only this table tab there, but there is also this chart tab there. And this is kind of a very easy way to create simple graphs. So you have some different kinds of chart types that you can choose for your data then you can, oftentimes you need to choose some kind of key and values that you want to use for this graph. So for example, in this sample, uh, the key is the item. So you get the different slices of the pie chart are the different items. And then the size is determined by the quantity and the sum of that quantity specifically. So this is like a really, really easy to use way to do charts. But of course, we have different graphics libraries or packages that we can also use to graph our data within a notebook. So for example, the plot package can be used uh, so that then you can maybe do some more complex visualizations and you have a lot more flexibility. But then again, you need to then be familiar with the specific code that you want to use. How do you need to set the different uh, variables and things like that that are needed there? So there you have to have a little bit more knowledge of how to use that specific package uh, in your code. But both are options and you can really get started with simple visualizations within the notebook itself as well. But of course, if you run it programmatically, uh, then you, know, you don't have the same right away visibility for it as you have with the interactive mode that we have been working here at the moment. 
Ah, yeah, I think with that, we actually are then ready for the last demo. Yes, that's so. true. We are ready <laughs> for the last demo. Some simple visualizations in directly in Spark Notebook. So yeah, no Power BI today. Uh, but and no pie more. charts. Yes, but I think it will be maybe one. Let's see. Uh, so I run this uh, very uh, basic uh, SQL query, select star from sales orders. And here I can switch between table and chart view. So I will select chart. This looks uh, very interesting and I can quickly get some insights from this. Of course, I'm kidding, <laughs> but yeah, I, I can customize this chart and then it will be much easier for me to understand what's going on. So in this case, I will switch from sales order number to the item. And then for values, I will select quantity instead of sales order line. Uh, number and finally I don't want averages I want sum and I will click apply and now you see Ooh. this makes much more sense so of nice. course this is not something that you will uh, show to your uh, C-level management but for quick data exploration a quick understanding about data distribution this is a great starting point so in literally like 30 seconds you you can understand what's going on but what I what else I wanted to show is also some of the libraries that uh, PySpark offers uh, for data visualization specifically. One of them, and I think the most popular, please Henny, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, is uh, uh, Matplotlib. So this one is yeah commonly used for data visualization tasks. In this case, I'm creating uh, a simple data frame, and then uh, by using Matplotlib in the next code cell. Let me show you and then we will walk to it. So first I will uh, move this data frame to uh, using Panda, Pandas library. And then I'm creating a simple uh, bar plot, bar chart, and defining what should be displayed on X axis and what should be displayed uh, within the bars. And finally to show this. So this is a basic example how, uh, how you can use uh, Matplotlib library. And also for some uh, more advanced stuff, uh, again, you can customize this, uh, uh, the look and feel of these visuals in, uh, in Python notebook. Additionally, in this case, I'm uh, including grid lines. Uh, I changed the color for, for my bars and also added titles, uh, uh, title on my visual and so on and so on. So it gives you a lot of flexibility what can be done. Uh, also, one more thing to, uh, that I want to show you is uh, something that is called figure. Again, I'm using matplotlib. And in this case, I'm returning revenue by year. So this is a figure generated by uh, matplotlib. Uh, one other thing before I move to show you another library is, uh, in this case, I am clearing the plot area. And yes, say yes to plot uh, to pie chart in this example. <laughs> so I can also place two different visuals uh, within one uh, result set, let's say. Uh, in this case, revenue per year and orders per year. Again, specifying different things uh, like legend, for example, what is the legend for pie chart, and so on and so on. Uh, of course, this is not a deep dive on data visualization with PySpark, but we wanted just mm -hmm. to give you a hint about what is possible and how you can quickly uh, visualize data that, that's coming from uh, from a notebook. And finally, uh, while Matplotlib uh, a library enables you to create really complex charts uh, multi of multiple types, it can sometimes require more complex code. And over the years, uh, many new libraries uh, uh, popped up that have been built on the base of Matplotlib uh, to yeah, abstract its complexity and enhance its capabilities. So one of them is called Seaborn. And I will show you now how you can use Seaborn to visualize the data. So this one is, I'm uh, importing Seaborn. And this time I promise is not a pie chart. It should be a bar plot. Yeah, I was worried because you promised no pie charts. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I, I like this one, like different colors, different everything. And again, I can uh, enhance this code with additional customization options. So uh, adding grid lines, 
uh, changing the, the, how it's called, opacity, and so on and so on. So there are many possible options. Uh, we encourage you, if you're interested in uh, understanding data visualization with Python in more depth to find a proper session or proper uh, resources for learning this. But as I said, it doesn't give you uh, rich possibilities as a data visualization tool like Power BI, mm -hmm. but still provides you with a quick insight about what is going on uh, with your with your data in in the lake house and i think yeah that was everything that i want to show you with this line visual uh i'm handing back over to you henny great uh thank you so much uh we saw many different options there that we can do with the visualization before we head on to the summary since we are starting to get out of time in just a moment so there was one really good question. That is, what is the difference between Delta table and external table? Uh, actually, both were Delta tables. So just one was where we let the lake house manage where is the data stored behind the scenes. And with the external table, on the other hand, we specified where is that data specifically stored. And then we can see it in the files section in our lake house explorer as well. So they are actually both Delta Lake format. So from that sense, they are the same, just the how the location is managed is different. We also got a very good comment that uh, one other option for the word wrapping is to use a pair of brackets. And that way you don't actually have to use the back backlashes slashes when you change rows. So that's another option. I've, I've heard different preferences from people on this, which one they like, as usual. Yes, yes, yeah. usual, yeah. <laughs> well, with that, we are able to get to the summary of this session. So what we went through is first we looked at how to configure Spark in Microsoft Fabric. Then we looked at uh, using both notebooks and Spark jobs and a little bit what is the difference between those two. Then we looked at Spark data frames and how to use those to analyze and transform data and also write data. And then we looked at using Spark SQL to query data in tables and views. And lastly, we looked at the visualization side as well. So quite many topics and there's quite a lot of details to look into in each of these. And what will definitely help you is if you go hands-on with the exercises that are in the Learn module. And in the Learn module, as one addition, you will also have uh, kind of this knowledge check portion as well, where you have some questions and you can answer. So you can then challenge yourself on whether you can pick the right answer from, from those options that are put for the questions there as well. Yeah, no prizes, but you will feel good. <laughs> exactly, when you get the green check marks, you can be really yes. like, okay, yes. I learned something. <laughs> Perfect. So one more time, uh, all the references, here's the link to the Learn Live module that we went through today. So you can use the QR code or the link there at the top. Then remember, we have a next session uh, tomorrow, actually. So there is work with Delta Lake tables in Microsoft Fabric. So you can continue this learning process, uh, Delta Lake tables. So we will more go into detail into Delta Lake and how do you define tables and so forth. Not us specifically, but the next speakers. <laughs> and then, uh, ah, there we go. So that will be happening tomorrow. Very much builds on what we went through today. And you will continue to see Spark appear once in a while there as well. Yes. <laughs> And as a last reminder, remember the 50% exam discount that is out there. And as we are starting to wrap up here, now is starting to be the last chance for you to get your questions in. We will just chat away here for a few more moments that we can check, are there any last questions in the chat on YouTube and see what else might be out there. Yeah, I I'd like to, Thank uh, our moderators. I saw they did an amazing job in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you. And of course, thanks to production team in the background. Yes, definitely. It makes this all so much easier. 
And definitely, you know, like even presenting on this topic, you always get to uh, learn so many new things on the go as well. Absolutely. Nice to deep dive. Absolutely, yeah. All right, but it uh, just checking in on the chat to see is there any last questions? We're seeing quite a bit of uh, thank yous out there. So trying to see if there's thank any... you for joining. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think thank you, Heini, for being <laughs> uh, amazing co-presenter with me today thank you yeah thank you it was really nice chance to get to present with you because you know we've been to quite many events together and yes, this was our yes. first time presenting together yes, so yes, always yes, a pleasure that's true always a pleasure yeah true seems that there's not any more questions out there uh so i think we are ready to wrap up for tonight to to this afternoon is it night or afternoon not sure anymore, but thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicola. It was a pleasure. And please do join the next session as well and continue this fabric journey. Thank you so much thank for you. joining. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Have a good evening.